So beginning our forum today, I'd like to begin with Sheikh, Wa Sheikh Wasim on this one. So we, we, so this is the basic idea of iconoclasm, destroying this imagery. Now, why is it when it comes to the regular perception, it's always spoken about in derogatory terms and in something that's negative? Please, Sheikh Wasim. <clears throat> Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ba'ad. So, from the earliest of times, idol worship, the setting up of statues, has always been something that has been seen as a lowly and a baseless practice for mankind. And it is pretty much a phenomenon in the time that we are living in now, to give people freedom of practice of religion, that it, you should not look down upon such practices. However, we know that from the, the start of, of man, from Adam alayhi salatu wasalam, and the generations that came after them, that the origin is that putting up statues and imagery was something that was clearly forbidden. And that it was either a direct uh, means to worshipping other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or it was a means leading to it. So therefore we find that within the Islamic tradition and looking back how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us throughout the stories of the prophets alayhim salam always this form of imagery, statue making and becoming uh, involved and engaged in that was looked down upon and rightly so. Why? Because it is a means and then an ultimate uh, arrival at setting up partners to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the example that the Prophet ﷺ gave to us in the hadith of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah that from the time of Adam alayhi salam up until Nuh alayhi salam, all people were upon a tawheed, no imagery, no erecting of statues and whatnot. But it is something now that after that it of course, it came about with the passing away of righteous people, which led then people to go astray. So from an Islamic perspective and from the start of humankind, that imagery was always looked down upon for the reason that it is a means to or directly people setting up partners to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. MashaAllah. Zakla khairan. So Sheikh, I mean, uh, it's, it's a bit of a wonder though. So it's always been looked down, frowned upon, but these days, the destruction of idols, it seems that that's what's been perceived as something negative. It's as if you're destroying heritage and culture. It almost seems like there's this sentimental value in that. So how did it come to this? It, it just seems a bit strange when we look at the historical movement of how this appeared. Yeah, so we live in a time now where you go around the world and you see different museums and they have so many different artifacts uh, from different eras, traditions and cultures. And it is viewed as a celebration of what they were upon. And it puts aside the right or wrong of what that was. So for example, you will not find uh, necessarily people who were clearly against the culture that you find that museum is in, things being displayed. So oppressors and wrongdo people who are wrongdoers, they're not going to display what they were doing in there. Because this is a sign of, if you like, celebration. However, subhanAllah, the Prophet as you rightly mentioned, and upon entering into Mecca, those idols and statues that were, you know, put inside the Kaaba or outside, they were not seen as that, let us keep them as a memory to see that this is what we are leaving. We want them to be wiped from the memories of people so that people are not uh, thinking about what they used to do. So it was destroyed, and rightly so, from the time of the Prophet wasallam, because this imagery, and what it represented was a direct uh, adu enemy, if you like, with what Islamic teachings are. But now, as you mentioned, there are sentimental attachments to these uh, idols and pictures and so on and so forth. But it is not explained that this is in direct you know, uh, opposition to the belief or the true belief. And this is, I guess, what you found or you do find in secular kind of uh, setups where the religious point of view looking at these kind of things is, is ignored completely. Mm. So as Muslims, we look at it, of course, from a different viewpoint completely. It is looked at from 
the point of view of al maslahat al sharia what is the benefit oh the benefit there's something that we have to keep in mind brothers and sisters we should not forget that for 13 years in mecca the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam lived and witnessed people worship and idols literally worship and idols instead of allah the almighty and he never left a finger he never pushed an idol he never destroyed an imagery rather he lived with it and uh, zaid ibn haritha may allah be pleased with him said i used to perform tawaf with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam even before he was commissioned with the prophethood and there were idols at every corner of the kaaba that they used to touch so he said don't you touch any of them and then the Prophet وسلم, was commissioned with the Nubuwa at the age of 40 and he stayed there until he was 53 and he used to perform tawaf and he never destroyed any of these idols because the maslaha, the benefit wasn't there. Rather he looked at it as from the perspective of the benefit risk ratio. Not only with regards to iconoclasm but also after the conquest of Mecca, there was a maslaha in destroying the idols. Why predominantly Mecca now is 100% Muslims. They were in an agreement. No one would ever object. No one would say, this is my God. How come that you're destroying my God? 100% a Muslim society. And the whole peninsula returned to monotheism, the religion of Ibrahim, alayhi salam. Yet, he says, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. To Aisha, Laula and Nakau Maki Hadithu Ahdin be Islam, Laat to Bina Al Kabati Ala Kawaidi Ibrahim. The Kaaba up until today is not built on the original foundations of Ibrahim, rather, only two pillars, a Ruknul Yamani and a Black Stone Corner. The remaining two pillars. When the Prophet ﷺ was only 35 years old, five years before the Nubuwa, the Meccans decided to remodel the Kaaba because it was falling apart, so they ran short of fun. And that's why there is something called Al Hijj. The Arsh is to surround an area which originally belongs to the Kaaba. They didn't have enough fun to build it fully on the foundations of Ibrahim. So now the Prophet ﷺ had the fun, have full access to uh, rebuild the Kaaba, remodel it, bring it to the ground and erect it again. But the Maslaha wasn't there. He thought that people might think that, oh, Muhammad is destroying the Kaaba, even though they were Muslims, but they were new to Islam. Mm. Amr ibn al-As conquered Egypt. It was not reported in any hadith or any author that he went around to destroy the idols or sphinx or they were not being worshipped. You have been monuments representing the pharaohs and their royal families and so on. So there were priorities which to bring people to Tawheed first. When the entire society is on the same page, automatically the society want to get rid of that. So got to keep in mind that if you live in a multi-faith society, you do not go around and destroy what others worship, even though from our perspective, we know that this is shirk and these images are idols and the people worship in them, worship them instead of the almighty Allah. Because the harm which will result out of that is much greater than any benefit. So this is something that we got to keep in mind before we go on to any other point. Now, what is the other point you wanted to discuss? So it seems, so that's uh, on the basis of destruction of what's already built. So the other problem here that we see is that even in a society that Tawheed has been established, it seems that throughout generations, people keep coming back to shirk. So, well, I address this in my talk. I'm sure many of you are aware of the primitive religions and the people who are Ahlul Fatra, they have not received the Prophet 
or between two prophets and they have no clue about monotheism, about God and who's God. There is a human tendency natural to look for a superpower. So sometimes the human beings ended up worshiping trees or certain animals or snakes, things that they fear or the jinn in the, in the, in the peninsula before Islam. Allah has recorded in Surah Al-Jinn that the people used to seek the help and seek refuge in the jinn from the harm of the jinn. So this is a human nature to look for a superpower. There comes a tawheed in order to replace that. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam marched towards Hunayn, who said the Muslim army which came to conquer Mecca were 10,000. In addition to 2,000 of Atulaqa, who are new to Islam, they accepted Islam right on the spot. So they passed by a tree which in Jahiliyyah, they used to hang their swords from their branches, seeking the barakah in order to gain victory. So they said, Ya Rasulullah, ij'al lana dhata anwat. They are still new to Islam. They don't have clue. At tawheed begins with negation. La ilaha. You deny. You negate the presence of any God. Then what is known as a tahliya or affirmation, which is illallah. So when this concept becomes obvious and crystal clear in the mind of the worshippers, of the muwahideen, automatically there is no room. There is no room for these images or idols. Or even as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, man alaqa faqad ashra. Where in talisman, ta'weez, or amulets, not only an idol or a statue before you or you seek its blessings. I saw in the West, the pennies, they carve some imagery. Or oh, the pens? Penny, the penny. Oh, the penny. Yes. Okay. The coins. The coin, which is the least unit in the dollar. What is this? They carve what they call it an angel. If you keep it in your wallet, if you wear it, you hang it from your neck in a chain, you will be protected. Many of the uneducated Muslims, they copy the same. There was one person coming from the Indian subcontinent, and he was wearing a talisman. So when the sheikh said, what are you wearing? He said, this is something that my mother said, as long as you're wearing it, you will be successful, and you will not be harmed. This is idol. So he tried to explain to him and he's, he's saying, no, 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 because my grandma gave it to me and I honor her advice. After a while, 20 years, he's wearing it, even whenever he's taking a shower, when he was finally convinced to remove it, so to undo it, and he opened it up and he found in it what? The leg of a mouse. Oh, a, a leg mouse. of a mouse oh, and some weird writings. Which means for 20 years, your prayer is invalid because you're wearing najasa. This is, if it is only the najasa, in addition to believing in an item like that, it protects you or it will uh, bring any benefit to you. There is no much difference between this and a big statue or idol because the human being is attached to seeking benefit. Or oh, seek a refuge against a harm from this particular object. What Allah the Almighty said in Surah Az Zumar in the beginning, when the Prophet وسلم, was doing like Ibrahim alayhi salam, convincing the people these are just idols, they cannot even hear you, let alone respond to you. They said, مَا نَعْبُدُهُمْ إِلَّا إِلَى اللَّهِ زُلْفَى he said, we're not really worshipping them. We're taking them as means of approach. So I hope, inshallah, what we're saying right now, that some of the youth or some of the elders who are wearing something or keeping something in their pocket or under their pillows or in the front mirror or in the glove compartment of their vehicles as means of protection, there is no much difference between these items and a statue or an idol.
So, mashallah, that's a really good point. When you mention that, Sheikh, immediately what comes to mind is a very common local practice. So, we have these symbols, some, some shop owners, they will put certain numbers, believing that that number will give them extra, or how would you say it, uh, wealth and so on. And some of them will hang certain ayat of the Quran. So, they will have this, uh, one of the fa very famous one is called Ayat Seribu Dinar. So, the ayah of a thousand dinars, for example. <laughs> and then they have also, like, they will have little Qur'ans that they will put on the corners of the ceilings. So, did I get that right, Sheikh? That means to say... That uh, you're absolutely people... right. As a matter of fact, some Muslims do have the practice that when they build a house or a building, uh, every pole, they bury a copy of the Qur'an for protection. They bury the copy yeah. of the Qur'an, okay. They, so they assume like many people in their shops, when they close the shop, they open the Quran and they leave it at the entrance for protection. Protection doesn't come from the physical copy mm. of the Quran. It comes from reading the Quran, comprehending the message. Kitab anzannahu ilayka mubarakun liyadabbaru ayatihi wa liyatadhakkara ulul albab. Verse number 29, Surah Sa'd, Allah said this, blessed book Allah sent it down to Prophet Muhammad وسلم, so that you people should ponder over it and take heed out of it. MashaAllah. Mm, Barakallah fiqh, Shaykh. Okay, so Shaykh Wasim, so one of, the, uh, one of the common symbols that's being practiced amongst the Malaysian community, and in fact, uh, you could say the region, including Indonesia, is something called the, the Chapal. You familiar with the Chapal? So the chapal is literally sandals or slippers which are believed by certain people to be the sandals of the Prophet ﷺ. So what they do is they will put these symbols in certain clothing or headgear and a lot of people purchase this thinking that, you know, it's something good. And so what we've seen here is a mix. So we have people who say that there's some extremes who believe that by having these symbols, you know, you, you're protected from harm. So that's, that's shirik. But there are also people who say, you know, this is just something that we associate with because we love the Prophet ﷺ. What is the right way we should understand this use and these symbols? So the use of symbols, items, is not something that you only find within Muslims, to be honest with you. I, growing up, I mean, I think you can see it anyway. I mean, let's say for example, Christians, that they will have a cross and they will wear the cross. Belief and different beliefs concerning the cross, it will protect them or so on. And within uh, other uh, factions within the Christian faith, they will have a chain and a small, like looks like a penny, a small coin. And there is a, a picture of an individual. And I mentioned it earlier, and he's, they call him St. Christopher. And it's an individual almost holding like a bag over his shoulder. And the belief is that when you have this, if you lose something, that you try to find this little coin shape, whether you wear it or it's in your drawer, you get it and you rub it. And that is the belief that whatever you've lost, that you will find it. That somehow there's a trust and a reliance and a belief that this item will help you. And similarly, this uh, sandal that you mentioned, and there are other items that Muslims, that they will have. There's the, the hand of uh, Fatima. I've seen this before. And there's an eye as well that they use as protection. All of these things that people have brought out because there is a weakness in their attachment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That they need some physical thing that they can touch, some tangible item, which allows them because of their weakness that I'm going to believe something that I can see and touch. That something is beyond the, is the unseen, their iman isn't strong enough to take them that far. However, Islam teaches us, Allah Jalla wa'ala teaches us that belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yes, all of these uh, is mentioned from the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah. Al-Ladheena yu'minuna bil ghayb. There's many items or uh, issues of our faith, which is part of the unseen. 
But this is part of our faith. And when a person's faith becomes weak or becomes reliant on other things, they will fall into such things. And just to the last point I want to mention here, and that it touches on uh, Sheikh Muhammad was mentioning earlier, and with the question was asked, why people are falling into these kind of things, these shirkiyat? Is it something natural for them? Because we, we see people doing that. Well, if we remember that the Prophet ﷺ told us that Kullu mawlud, that every child born, yuladu ala al-fitra, that they are born into a state of fitra. And now the question is then, what is this fitra that we are for talking about? This is this natural innate state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created mankind to recognize and affirm one creator, one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that before we came into the existence in this earth, we affirmed that. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to address Adam alayhi salam and all of his progeny that was taken from his back. These are some verses that I mentioned in Surah Al-A'raf. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just, oh, am I not your Lord? Then we affirm that Allah jalla wa is our Lord. So the starting point of all of us is to believe in one creator, one Lord. However, the Prophet ﷺ said that, but there will be situations where that the person is changed. That the parents, who may be from the people of the book, will impact that small child and change them. The purpose of mentioning the hadith is what? is that the, the starting point is that they will believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but their environment or those who are around them will impact them. It will have an effect on them. So the natural state isn't for us humankind to veer towards idol worship. Not at all. The starting point is a tawheed, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what you are exposed to, what you will see, if you're not careful, that will impact you and affect you. And then you will start following these, of course, false practices. Oh, subhanAllah. So it's the environment that shapes, that distorts this fitrah from deviating from worshipping Allah alone. It is, an Im it is, yes, an impact, but it is not necessarily always the case because you find, subhanAllah, in, in lands where there are maybe few Muslims and people embrace Islam. Mm. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide that individual regardless of the environment that they are in. But the point is that it can have an impact on that individual, what they are exposed to and what they can see. Okay, mashallah. So, Sheikh, you mentioned something that really caught my attention, that when people have these amulets, these, uh, these, these forms of uh, like seeking protection, that their hearts get attached to these things. And I've actually experienced this firsthand. So, when we go to some families to say provide sadaqah for them we notice that they have these little symbols at home and we ask you know auntie what's this uncle what's this and they say oh that one we just bought it from uh, they call it ustad they they think these are ustad so they can't really differentiate because they look like they're selling ayat of the quran and you know they don't really know that these are not ayat of the quran they they have symbols that look like symbols for in, invite uh, invocating jinn so you have these alif alif and so on and it's interesting that so for some of them when we dispose of these items and say, okay, uh, you know, auntie, this is shirik, you know, you can't do this, Islam prohibits against this. And so they say, okay, uh, eventually we convince them to, to get rid of it, alhamdulillah. But after that, they get very restless. Okay, where are those guys? Where are those brothers who destroyed me? Ever since you got rid of that, we, I, there's all these bad luck happening upon me. So is that an example of that? Like, what's really happening? I, if, if I recall correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, there was a narration that says that uh, I think one of the companion's wives was, was wearing these uh, amulets and saying that what has happened. So when you put on this amulet, so the, the wife was claiming that while they were wearing it, this, this twitching was stopping. And so it was claimed that, uh, Ibn Mas'ud, I believe, and it was claimed that what shaitan is doing is he's twitching you. And when you wear that, he stops twitching you. So is that the right way we should understand that? And how can we approach this in society if we see these kinds of, these kinds of imageries and especially these kinds of uh, things that can lead to shirk? There's a very important principle in da'wah, in calling people to the straight path. It is not about destroying another person's belief 
or dismantling what that person may believe in and then just leaving them there. And I've seen many examples where there are discussions between Muslims, non-Muslims, and Muslims and other Muslims who have some issues. And the discussion is there just to dismantle the belief, the false belief that they uphold. And they can see, see, that you are wrong. And then they walk away. And you've left a vacuum. You left a space. And the point is here is that this is not the methodology of the Quran or the Sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam to just dismantle the false beliefs. But if you, the example that you gave, where you speak to a Muslim and you explain to them that these, uh, these ta'weeth or these things that your heart is attached to, why are you getting rid of this? And why did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tell some of the Muslims even to get rid of that? One of them was wearing something on his arm. He said, why are you wearing this? He said, because I have some illness and things like that. He said, this will only increase you in your illness. Mm. So get rid of it. Mm. Your trust is not in these items. But your ultimate trust, reliance and worship is to be directed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if they accept that, that your trust is not in these items and that they know for sure that it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I need to be trusting and worshipping. Whatever happens in the future, we just got rid of the understanding of the, the, the good luck in these items. Similarly, this, the bad luck on the same token is not from the not presence or the lack of presence of these things as well. So the person who may think or may have an understanding, I got rid of it now and things are not going well for me, it means that they weren't, they, uh, the da'wah or the understanding that reached them wasn't fully comprehended by them. They only understood part of it. They understood part, yes, okay, I'm going to get rid of it, but you need to have full faith. And one example is that some woman, she was complaining that she had bad dreams. She went to Araqi. And that every night she would perform her adhkar, Misa'at al Kursi, but to, to no avail. So she went to the Sheikh and he said, What is it that you do? And she said, I do. He said, Continue reciting Ayat al Kursi. She went away, came back, she says, No benefit. Remember that the Prophet ﷺ told us that reciting Ayat al Kursi before you sleep is a protection until the morning. So he reminded her that your belief, your conviction of the benefit in which or in what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Nabi told us is absolutely key. Her lack of conviction was her downfall. So when she was educated on this matter, she found that there was the benefit in that. And so therefore the understanding must arrive in that person's mind fully and the correct process of how to arrive at a correct understanding and what it means to truly rely upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to give up on these worldly items. Once that is done, you will find that inshallah ta'ala that the Muslim will have a good understanding of a tawakkul, a trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that will strengthen them. Wallahu ta'ala ala. MashaAllah, barakallah feek. So the key here, Sheikh, if I got this correct, is to make sure the education is there. They understand the why behind it so that they themselves will truly embody the spirit of what Tawheed wants, which is to put full reliance and trust in Allah. And when they recite, because sometimes we hear some phrases being thrown around that, oh, I recite Ayatul Kursi and yet still this is happening to me. So it seems that the, the problem there in the first place was that they themselves lack that conviction. So the key here is to have that conviction and making sure that that, that reliance is strong in the first place. MashaAllah. So Dr. Muhammad Salah, uh, I'd like to lead, lead up to this uh, slide with a, with a lead up question to this. So in Malaysia, we live in a society that has many different cultural backgrounds. We have Chinese, we have Indians, we have the, even the local, uh, the local tribes, there are many different, there are different styles and many of them very, have very exotic, unique cultural practices. And sometimes it's very, very difficult to tell apart which ones have some religious connotation. Some of them look relatively harmless. Some of them have these, uh, these, uh, maybe these, these uh, practices, these rituals. And then we learn later on that, oh, subhanAllah, this is some form of idol worship. And then, you know, we, and then suddenly we are taken aback by that. 
So for example, when we look at the Perlis um, Center of Wisdom, they start to expose yeah, some of these cultural practices that you've been attending. Oh, guess what? What they're doing is actually a form of idol worship. So what are some guidelines on... Because there, there's also an aspect that sometimes we feel we need to integrate and be part of the society. We, we want to get close to them, supposedly with the long-term goals of Dawa. At the same time, suddenly we find ourselves trapped in this. So how can we... What do you advise us and how can we approach this? First of all, uh, we need to look into the verse of Surah Al-An'am in which Allah Almighty says, وَلَا تَسُبُّوا الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ فَيَسُبُّوا اللَّهَ عَدْوًا بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ This is a Quranic guidance as how to deal with false deities. From my perspective, what they are worshipping is a false deity. Is not God. But I do not address them with foolishness lest they turn around and now they curse my God who is the true God unknowingly. So I am the one who took the initiative. Secondly, it is very important for us as believers to distinguish between what is religious and what is cultural. Not only in the matters of aqidah, belief, and tawheed, but also in the religious practices and even in the adat. Thirdly, so much time is wasted in argument, disputes, with regards to the hayat in the prayers. Things which would not affect the validity of the salah. Whether we should announce al-basmala or not. Move the index finger up and down or sideways whenever. So when we bring to the public these arguments and we spend so much time in it while people are much in need to learn their aqidah and belief first. Stated how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spent 13 years in Mecca focused on establishing the matter of aqidah and tawheed to replace the false practices of shirk. Once when I was teaching about the virtue of salatul istikhara. 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 And it was in a medical community, we were all doctors, that is in the States. And then one of them, one of the biggest doctors in town said, Oh my God, I did the same thing that you're talking about. When I was given an offer to move from New York to such and such, such state, it's a big move. And we're talking about millions of dollars. I didn't know what to do. So I flipped the coin. Yeah, I flipped the coin. Whether I should go or not. Serious decisions like that, when a Muslim is unaware of how to make a decision, which is simply to consult Allah the Almighty, yeah. that indicates that I am as a sheikh of the community, as an imam of the masjid, it's my shortcoming because I cause the community to get sucked in, in disputes in the furu'a, in the hayat, while it was my duty in the first place to explain to the people what is right and what is wrong. And whenever I see some practice which is perceived as shirk, to clarify that to the community. So there is a difference between living with non-Muslims in the same society. I do not necessarily respect nor agree with their practices or their belief. But I do not curse nor criticize their gods because I know the percussion of that, the outcome of that. لا تسبوا الذين يدعون من دون الله. Do not insult the gods that they worship instead of Allah, lest they end up insulting. فَيَسُبُّ اللَّهَ عَدْوًا بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ Out of consecration but without knowledge. So what am I supposed to do? Teach the aqidah of Tawheed. 
Look how the Almighty Allah, for instance, responded to the Christians with regards to taking Jesus alayhi salam or Isa alayhi salam as God. What does the Quran say? In Surah Al-Ma'idah, the Almighty Allah says, مَا الْمَسِيحُ بِنُ مَرْيَمَ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرُّسُلِ وَأُمُّهُ صِدِّيقَةٌ كَانَا يَأْكُلَانِ الطَّعَامِ Wallahi, well, when I use the same approach, whether in interface dialogue or giving one-on-one -on -one da'wah, it works perfect. The Quran says, Jesus, the son of Mary, and his mother were just human beings. What is the proof? Logical proof. They both used to eat. Ah, okay. They were in need for sustenance. They needed a sustainer. And what happens when you eat? You need a drink. When you eat, you drink, you digest. There is what? You need to... There is a waste. Right. So without hurting the feeling of others. So when you teach people about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then they're convinced, they take shahada, and you do the transformational process, take them from disbelief and shirk into belief. This is how you spread your religion without really uh, being affected by the religion of others, nor causing any hard feeling to others. If there is any practice which I do not know whether it is an act of shirk or not, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, إِنَّمَا دَوَاءُ الْعِيِّ sual. The remedy is to ask. Not to practice, then ask. And that applies even to the ibadat and the mu'amala. Some people, after they finish the business transaction, which is 100% pure usury, they come and they ask, Sheikh, Sheikh Wasim, uh, is this transaction halal? Well, the question should precede the action, the transaction. Now, after you already made the transaction and it went wrong or you lost or whatever you say, so what am I supposed to do? Did he ask me beforehand? Right? Right. So I love that, Sheikh. So just as how we approach Ibadah, before we establish that it's something in Sharia or not, in that same way as well, when we get involved in cultural practices, ask that fundamental, fundamental question first. And then if you don't know, keep on asking until you get the answer. And then you can make a decision. Okay, mashallah, barakallah, very good. So Sheikh Wasim, um, so you've uh, had experience as an imam in the West. And I'm just like, not even in the West, even here in Malaysia, we're exposed to many different practices, especially among the youth, that have elements of something that's clearly against Islam. So we have, for example, the most basic things, for example, horoscopes. It's, it's being spread ab about very matter-of-factly, very, very easy to find, looks very harmless. We have things like uh, Ouija boards that people play and you know, people think that it's something fun. And they have games like Spirit of the Coin and so on and so forth. So how do we, what are some tips on how we can educate our youth in simple terms so that they, we can protect them from falling into these forms of shirk? <clears throat> Sheikh Muhammad is mentioning the situation about somebody had made a transaction and made lots of money. And this money was all riba, usury. This incident actually came to me, as it comes to many, I'm sure. And then when I said to them that this mal or this benefit that you have, I'll answer your question, so just moving on. Sure, sure. Yeah. This money that you made is khabith, it's filthy. You need to get rid of it as soon as you can. You cannot touch it. When you give it away, there's no intention for sadaqa, nothing. So they said, okay. Can I give it to my mother? Huh. So the money, they didn't want to get rid of it. Okay. Can I give it to my mother? I said, of course, it's, it's filthy money. Why would you want to give such a money to your own mother? But it's not sadaqa. So doing the action before the question can put you in such predicaments where you start wanting to make a choice. And then maybe you don't make the right choice when you ask. So the hujja or the 
uh, establishment of evidences further upon you. So it's a very, very dangerous situation in doing things without asking. Now we live in a time where shaitan, Ouija boards, horoscopes, all of these things are somehow trivialized. And what do I mean by trivialized? To an extent as though لا حقيقة لها, that it has no reality, that it's just fun and games. The times that we live in now, these types of things, which are from an Islamic point of view, when you look at them individually, are clearly linked to a reality connected to shaitan and harming you. But from the other side, it's trivialized. It's, it's not real. It's just a game. So you may see these practices in magazines or on social media or on films. And because it's portrayed in this manner that it's lighthearted and the Muslim is exposed to this time after time after time, it's like, yeah, but it doesn't really mean anything. But there is always an element that the person, even though if they say it's, they don't believe it, when you start to go a little deeper, they are attached to it, that it's not just a game. That the horoscope that they read, and it tells that maybe in the next year or in the next month, depending on how often that horoscope it comes out, they will be looking out for signs to say whether that what was said or the time of year that they were born in, they meet somebody, do they have a similar kind of, or a, a star sign which is monasib for them. I even noticed now, the Muslims, they say when they meet a potential spouse, what's your star sign? Because star signs, I'm a particular star sign, and our personalities will get on if you have this star sign. Mm. This is not from Islam at all, where it was trivialized and the, they saw it as something lighthearted, but then it becomes more than that. It becomes more than that, then it starts to settle in the heart. And when it settles in the heart, this is how it begins to take you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you can see the same understanding, the same trend with all that we have mentioned before. That all these things, if you like, are you can say outlawed within Islam. What is ta'weeth, or these things that you may wear, or the signs. All of this is drawing you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Quran, the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa all of that is to bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there was a constant battle and the shaitan wanting to confuse you because shaitan has a reality. When you are sleeping, when you are resting, he's there thinking what he can do to you. Not necessarily thinking about the short term. He's thinking about the long term. So he pushes you towards certain friends and that those certain friends have certain beliefs. Now the Prophet ﷺ told us that all prophets, they were shepherds. Now for most Imams, they will not be shepherds. However, I see, Wallahu A'adam, that the modern day equivalent of that is being an Imam of a masjid, that you get to see a community, the different personalities, the different people, and you can see the different approaches, the journeys of individuals. Because you're connected to a community, you're connected to a people, you can see when they come to the masjid where they are, and you can see how they developed one, one way or the other. So it's a very blessed and privileged position. And I can say that whoever has experienced and has the experience of being an imam, who is part of a community, has responsibility over a community, whether you have the name of an imam or not, but have a responsibility towards a community, you will see that these matters and horoscopes and all of these things are very real and impacting the Muslim community in a very, very negative way. Although they may say in, with their tongues, no, I don't believe it, it is just a game. When you scratch the surface, it is more than that. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to know the realities of these matters, to educate one another and to have true reliance and trust upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ameen. Ameen. It's interesting that you shared about our experience. I think what we've also observed in the West, the roles of Imams in the West are quite elaborate, um, quite extensive. So to the extent that you are almost like leaders of the community, the, the youth seek your advice. And that's why 
that brings you that connection with them for, for you to have that line of uh, advice? Yeah, sure. I mean, the, the role of the imam in, uh, in different, it differs from different countries, where in some countries they're there just to lead the salah, five daily prayers, and then they go home to lead the Jumu'ah each week. And that is the role of the imam, to ensure that the prayer is established in the masjid, and that is it. They may have uh, different responsibilities. They may read some ahadith after salah, for example, within the West. The role of the imam is very different. The environment is completely different. I mean, Islamic Muslim countries, when you leave the masjid, alhamdulillah, more often than not, you see, you hear the adhan, you see a Muslim environment, alhamdulillah, there's some preservation there. The lands of the non-Muslims, then it is very different. Therefore, the role of the imam is much more hands-on. He's there to advise, to speak, counseling for this between the husband and wife or disputes between people in the community. So their role is very, very much a leader within their communities from, from this perspective, as, as you mentioned, yes. MashaAllah. I love also the way that you said that how shaitan uh, tricks people into this. It's almost as if fun and games is the marketing strategy for shaitan to lead people into shirk. It looks very harmless, looks very fun, looks very cool, looks very, it's okay, it's cool. Like even like, you know, those gambling machines that you put in money and then you take the claw and it looks very fun. Looks like a four-year-old could play it very easy, but subhanAllah, it's, it's haram. So it seems like this is one of the ways that shaitan is leading people into, oh, it's just, no, it's just pre pretty harmless. The shaitan will beautify the haram. The haram won't be something which is more bitter. The haram at times may be, appear to be sweet and nice and enjoyable. But the impact of that long term is that it will harm you. And then there is indeed a bitterness. And there is a want to get out of it. And living in the West, and when I say the West, of course, it's a very broad word. I can speak for the country that I live in, within the UK, that those who are living and doing as they wish, when they wish, whether it is gambling and alcohol and fornication, all of these things, they eventually, they hit a limit, a threshold in what they're getting out of it. And that there is no satisfaction, no inner satisfaction in doing such deeds. So for example, the person is engaged in zina, riyadhan billah. And they are lost in such an evil act. And they want to get out of it. They want to get out of it. However, if you look at the, if you like the nuts and bolts of the issue, a person who is married is satisfying their same desire. However, there is, when you are conducting yourself under the umbrella or under the guidance with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to you, there is something in that that the person will not have, even though they may be doing the same action. Of course, the approaches will be different. But getting married and having halal relationships is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless. The same action which is done in complete opposite of that, you will never find a satisfaction of that. And people are fed up. They're fed up in all the haram and the freedom, so-called freedom that, that they have. It's not, they're not satisfied with that. And they're looking for something else. By the thousands. And when you present the basic message of what Islam is, they are drawn towards it immediately. So these are things that we need to bear in mind. That the shaitan will beautify the haram, but there will never be any true satisfaction or happiness in that. This can only be truly attained by following what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to you. Allahu Alam. MashaAllah. Jazakallah khairan. So, Sheikh Muhammad Salah, we have one question related to images again. So, I think it's very well established right now that because of this imagery, that's the first emergence of shirk. And this imagery is something that people do with the right intention, but shaitan leads them to haram. But what about when it comes to something that People say, you know, pictures of my loved ones. I want to hang them up. I want to put it up on my, uh, on, my, on my wall. It's nothing to do with worship. 
but I just love to see my daughter, my son, my uh, my mother looking at them makes me happy. So, but it also seems like Islam has a strictness even in this. So how can we approach this in the right way and understand this? Once there is a hukm, a hukm means a verdict from Allah or his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then the believers should instantly comply and they should not have a second thought or give a different explanation. Allah says, إِنَّمَا كَانَ قَوْلَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذَا دُعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ لِيَحْكُمَ بَيْنَهُمْ أَنْ يَقُولُوا سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا If you consider yourself one of the believers, then once Allah and His Messenger have decreed or decide in your hukm, you should not have a second thought. You shouldn't say, well, in the past, because there was a fear that they may end up worshipping the idols, but now there is no fear because we're Muslims, we're believers. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, angels shall not enter a house in which there is a dog. A lot of Muslims keep dogs as pets. And they say, well, I take it as security. For security. And you know that puppy cannot even protect itself. But you're trying to justify your misdoing by giving it a different name. That is haram. So it is not permissible to keep a dog at home. No, it is not permissible. He said, the angels shall not enter a house in which there is a dog or a hanging picture. Whether it's a statue or a curtain that have imagery or a picture of your loved ones, it is okay to keep it in your album, on your phone, on your desktop, but hanging them is not permissible. You might think you're safe and immune against shirk and against falling in shirk. But let me tell you this. Human beings are very vulnerable, even in their iman. Even those who pray. Why? If you check out Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, the verses 117, 18, and 19, and the conversation and the dialogue between Allah and Satan, Iblis. In 119, a shaitan vows, saying, وَلَا أُضِلَّنَّهُمْ وَلَا أُمَنِّيَنَّهُمْ وَلَا أَمُرَنَّهُمْ فَلَا يُبَتِّكُنَّ آدَانَ الْأَنْعَامِ Look at shaitan, very rude, very blunt. He's telling Allah because you drove me out of heaven because of Adam. I shall mislead them all away. He asked me, how did they end up worshiping idols? We'll cover that in the lecture. Ten generations from Adam to Noah, they were all believers. When they initially wanted to commemorate the remembrance of those super righteous people, Shaitan made it seem fair to them to carve their images so that they remember them to be inspired by them. But after a while, they started seeking the blessings from them. Muslims, they go for Hajj. And they say, Labbaik, Allahumma Labbaik, and they declare Tawheed, but in their actions, they do the opposite. Wallahi, when you see a woman taking off her scarf and wiping it, again is the showcase which have Maqamu Ibrahim. It's a glass. What is this for? Because she has seen people doing it. This is a source of barakah. The barakah happens when you make tawaf, when you supplicate. The bricks of the Kaaba, they were not all from heaven, only Al Hajar al Aswad. And even though Al Hajar al Aswad, it's a sunnah to touch and kiss, Umar al Khattab says, by Allah, I know that you do not benefit nor protect against any harm. I'm only kissing you because I have seen the Prophet ﷺ kiss you. How does the shaitan persuade the believers in order to take them out of faith and make those who said, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah fall in shirk? The guys, how many of you here in the medical field? 
whether pharmacy or medicine or any of you, can you raise your hand, please? Any doctors or nurses? Doctors and nurses. Oh, mashallah, we have one there. So how many of you besides the doctors heard about uh, the term placebo? You heard about placebo before? What is placebo for the masses who do not placebo, no placebo? The FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, in order to approve a drug, it has to have a real effect, not placebo. What is placebo? We bring number of patients and give them inactive ingredients in the form of capsule or tablets or syrup. And we say, this is the most effective medication for bronchitis. If you, for instance, if you drink it on regular basis, three times a day, you will be healed. Even though it's nothing but water with a dye, with a color. Mm. Or in the tablets, starch, pure inactive ingredients. 50% of the patients who administer this inactive ingredients will recover. <laughs> but there is no medication. There is no active ingredients. There is no antibiotics in it. But because of being inspired mm. under the influence psychologically that if you take this, you will recover. I want to link this to what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. That before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Surah Al-Jinn and we came to know how some people, fortune tellers and the palmists, the palm readers, what they do before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had been sent, the jinn used to spy on the angels' writings of the decrees of the annual decrees when Allah the Almighty decrees to them what they have to do throughout the year on Laylatul Qadr. So they spy We used to take like specific seats in order to spy on the angels. Then they will go down and deceive people. They will go to a monk, a soothsayer, a fortune teller, and they will provide him with one correct information. Like on December the 22nd at 12 A.M. exactly. There will be a major earthquake. <laughs> so he prophesizes that a year in advance. And when it happens, that's it. Everybody believes in this person. He knows the ghaib. <laughs> Alongside with it, they will lie 100 lies. But people will not forget the lies of the soothsayer. They would only remember that he predicted the earthquake will happen. Or a child will be born. Or this guy will marry this girl, whatever, yani. So be careful of that. Don't you think you're immune against shirk? Once you said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. You need renewal of that. How would you protect yourself while you invite the shayateen into your house? Allah said, obey the messenger of Allah. He said, if you hang pictures in your house, angels will not enter. What does it mean when the angels do not enter? It's a playground for shaitan. It's a playground for the shaitan. So you need to look at it this way. You should, we should stop justifying our wrongdoings because of our whim or desire and say, well, that was in the past. But now, alhamdulillah, I'm strong in iman. If the sahaba feared for their iman, if the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam frequently said, Ya muqallib al-qulubi thabbit qalbi ala deenik. Who am I to think that I'm strong enough not to change? Follow and do not innovate. MashaAllah, barakallah fi. So alhamdulillah, that leads to our last question of the forum. But we have a couple more minutes. And this is the final segment of the very first Perlis International Sunnah Convention. So I'd like to spend maybe a couple of minutes, one or two minutes for our two speakers, Sheikh Wasim and Dr. Muhammad Salah, to do a wrap up on some closing advice for our participants of the very first PISC 2024. So we'll begin with Sheikh Wasim, some parting advice for our participants, inshallah. What I would say first and foremost is, alhamdulillah, awwalan wa akhiran, to begin with and to end with, all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That he has facilitated this gathering for me for two days. 
but I know that the preparations have been going on for more than two days. My participation is really just to, is a small part. And that there are those who have been actively preparing, very busy, making sure that this conference, inshallah ta'ala, is up and running. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward every brother and sister who had a hand or any participation in that. And that whoever or whatever you did, whether you brought the chairs, which you may see as a menial job, you are bringing in chairs or you put flowers on the stage or you're the cameraman or that you are setting up the stage, whatever you did, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you for that and everything that happened, you are a piece of the jigsaw to ensure that you are rewarded and you came as well. You came here to listen. You took your time out away from your families. You traveled some, I heard some people, they traveled in other states. They came here seven hours in the car to attend. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you and bless you. And I hope that inshallah ta'ala that this can be a conference that can reoccur to educate the Muslims. And I, I saw earlier that there's another conference in May and the, it was yeah. in Malay, I'm not sure what the details are, but see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows things to, to continue, you, that you have a good intention. And a parting advice is an advice that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he gave to, in fact, it is mentioned by two companions, Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu an, and Abu Dhar al-Ghifari. That fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wherever you are. Ittaqillaha haythu ma kunt. Fear Allah wherever you are. In public and in secret at home. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa atbi is sayyat al hasanah tamhuha. And that if you commit a bad deed, follow it up with a good one. Repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that the bad deed is erased. And deal with people with the best of manners. And these three advices, they cover the three different relationships that we all have. The first relationship is with your Lord, and that is the most important. To fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wherever you are as much as you can. That's your relationship with your Lord subhanahu. And the second one is that if you commit a a sin, a bad deed, which is the relationship that you have with your own self, to respect yourself, to honor yourself correctly. That if you do a bad deed, follow it up with a good deed. And don't try to play a game that I know one bad deed is one bad deed and one good deed is 10. So if I commit the haram and I ask, or oh, they do something good, the 10 will outweigh the bad deed. This is not the type of game that we play with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a deception from shaitan. But the genuine mistakes that we make, that we are regretful of that. And make up for your mistake. And the third relationship is with others. You deal with people in the very best way. You never cheat. You never deceive. You never curse. You never wrongdo or oppress. You treat people just as they should be treated and just as you would like to be treated. As you would like to be treated, this is how you will treat others. I just want to say this. May Allah Azza wa Jalla bless you all. Allahum ameen wa jazakum Allah khairan. Ameen. Jazakallah khairan. And Dr. Muhammad Salah, parting words for you, inshallah. Of course, as the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, one who's not grateful to people who do him or her a favor eventually is not grateful to Allah. So I begin by thanking the Almighty Allah for facilitating this event for us to attend and for you as well. And thank the organizers from top to bottom and from bottom to top. Secondly, an advice for myself. And for my fellow brothers and sisters in Islam, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, may Allah have mercy on him, said, people are in need for ilm, for the religious knowledge, than 
more than their need for eating and drinking. We need to eat and drink twice or thrice a day. Some people eat four times, five times, that's it. But our need for knowledge is with every breath we take. One single knowledgeable person in the deen is much more powerful against Satan than 1,000 worshippers. Worship without deep knowledge, shaitan can still deceive you. There was a worshiper who heard about a tree that people used to literally worship. So he took his axe and he decided to cut it off. On the way, shaitan disguised as a human being. He said, what are you up to? He said, I'm going to remove this tree because people worship it instead of Allah. He said, no, 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 forget about it. He said, I'm going to do it. He said, I'm going to stop you. So they wrestled and the Abid defeated physically a shaitan and overcame him. So he said, listen, I'll make a deal with you. If you leave the tree alone, every day you will receive from me one golden dinar. Scratched his head and said, and what if you don't? He said, in this case, you have the axe and the tree is there. You can always go and uproot it. So he said, a deal. And every day he would deposit the dinar, the golden coin beneath his pillow. And then one day he stopped. So this guy decided, I know what to do. He got, of, he got hold of his axe and he went ahead to remove the tree. Same guy who's actually a shaitan appeared to him and he intercepted him. He said, I'm going to stop you. He said, you can't. I'm going to beat you again. So they wrestled. But this time the shaitan defeated him and defeated him easily. He said, how come? He said, before it's the first time you're doing it for the sake of Allah. And this time you're doing it for the sake of the dinar. Inna al-ilma nur. The greatest immunization against deviation is knowledge. And knowledge, we do not give knowledge our spare time. No, we have to dedicate time as much as it is important to learn math and biology and chemistry and second and third language. It is more important to learn about our relationship between us and Allah how to perfect it and learn from Allah what he wants from us. That's why in the Sawan Hadith, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Khayrukum, the best of all of you, who? Man ta'allam al-Qur'ana wa'allama. The one who learns the Qur'an, then what? Teaches it to others. How would you teach without knowledge? Spend time and learn. MashaAllah, it is very convenient now to study even at home, in your bedroom. You can be a doctor, an accountant, an engineer, a janitor, it doesn't matter. But every person must learn about what will take him to the destination Jannah. If you don't, you will be easily persuaded by the shaitan to deviate. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the useful knowledge, so we say, اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما as the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم used to say in his dua oh Allah teach us what will benefit us and benefit us out of what we have learned already and increase us in knowledge وقل رب زدني علما in his speeches صلى الله عليه وسلم and his talks normally after he finishes he used to say لِيُبْلِغِ الشَّاهِدُ مِنْكُمُ الْغَائِبَةِ Let those who are present convey my message to who are absent. So the zakah, zakah is not necessarily only on money in cash and produce, but also on knowledge. You attended for two consecutive days. You have learned so much. The zakah of that, of that is to impart some of this knowledge to others. 2,000 people attended. If you share that with another 2,000 people, this is how knowledge spread. And this is how the Sunnah replaces the Bid'ah. 
and this is how we establish the deen. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا.